Thank you very much, and I hope the technology holds up reasonably well. I, I will answer my, untypically for a politician, I will answer my own question <laughs> straight away by saying no. We are no nearer to sorting out counter-radicalisation. I'll say a little bit more about that. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a real privilege to be an honorary professor in the, um, in the CSTPV, St Andrews. I have to tell you that St Andrews was forced upon me. My wife, who is a QC, Alison Levitt, is an alumna of St Andrews. She originally studied history of art at St Andrews University before she went on to what she'd already chosen as a career as a bachelor. And she very much enjoyed those four years of relaxation and partying. Um, and living in Crail with friends and having a generally good time. And I'm really sorry that we're not doing this in St Andrews, where we could all be having a really good time in that beautiful city. Um, but there we are. Um, I've come to talk about legislation. And uh, I've been a legislator, as it were, since 1983, as a part of, apart from a small gap. I've been a member of one or other House of Parliament since 1983. And so I have been involved in a lot of bills and I've always taken part in legislative procedures with a degree of enthusiasm, probably because I'm a lawyer. I think it's important to say at the outset that legislating is not a logical process. The way we do it is not logical. Bills are put through the mill in Parliament and I don't know if you, any of you have seen your grandparents' old mangle, which they fed through the washing to get them to squeeze the water out of it. But it always, always in my memory came out with an awful lot of creases and legislation comes out with an awful lot of creases. We do not have empirical legislation. Try as parliamentary draftsmen do produce smooth piece of legislation, the parliamentarians, usually for political reasons, can always be relied upon to mess it up and leave it full of crinkles, which, of course, gives a living to people like me in my role as a lawyer. Um, now, to be less cynical than that, um, what are the watchwords that make law credible? I suggest to you that there are three qualities that make law acceptable and credible. First, the proportionate upholding of rights. Do not overlook the world. Secondly, the application of common sense. And third, meeting the expectations that the responsible majority hold for the law. And do not overlook the word responsible next to majority. So, Proportionate upholding of rights, the application of common sense and meeting the expectations that the responsible majority hold for the law. Now, my particular interest in the last 20 years has been in terrorism, and I feel that I should start with some basic credentials, which may assist the uh, students. Um, and I mean by that students, young and old, um, to conclude that even if contrary Controversial in part, my conclusions are considered evidence based in the sense to withstand what to me is familiar, sometimes very audible and withering, but often inaccurate. I was the independent reviewer of terrorism legislation, the IRTL, from the 11th of September 2001 until early 2011. So I started on the day of 9-11, just hours before the Twin Towers were hit. I was called and asked by the Home Secretary of the time, David Blunkett, if I would become the independent reviewer of terrorism legislation. Uh, about uh, three and a half hours later, after I had accepted in principle, uh, the Twin Towers were hit, an event which changed not merely my professional life, but more to the point, dramatically changed international political dynamics. 9-11 caused nothing less than a fundamental reassessment of the risks and threat of terrorism in almost every country in the world. As a dominant theme, it replaced old Cold War, nation-based political thinking. 
And it should be remembered, please, that Islamist terrorism has affected Muslim countries at least as deeply as non-Muslim countries. Now, let's put it in today's context, because context is always key to any debate. In the past 12 months, the context has changed. Over 100,000 British citizens, young and mostly older, have died from COVID-19, not from terrorism. It's laid bare to all of us, especially we of older generations, our vulnerability to natural phenomena. It's exposed the frailties of human planning, even when carried out by prominent politicians and scientists, almost all of high ability and all capable of sharing their diverse qualifications and life experiences. COVID has heightened our sensitivity to events, even elevating an unwise walk in the woods to political crisis status. So there is a risk, in my view, that the volume and outcomes of COVID-19 may lead some to disregard terrorism or see it now in relative terms as a minor issue. They should not forget, though, that according to analysis released in November 2019 by the respected Institute for Economics and Peace, the UK was found to be the EU country most affected by terrorism, ahead of France, Germany, Belgium and Spain, and outside the EU, surprisingly, ahead of Sri Lanka, Iran, Russia and Israel. And nobody should underestimate the terrible trauma, both physical and conceptual, that terrorist attacks cause to victims, to the public at large and to the government. The demand for something to be done is never shriller and nowhere shriller than on the floor of the Houses of Parliament. These are events which citizen la citizens at large can find it difficult to understand. Their reaction to terrorists is an illustration of a sentiment expressed by Othello to Desdemona, forgive this flight of fancy, when Othello said to her, I understand a fury in your words, but not the words. The anxiety of the public experience from terrorism is less easy to comprehend than our reaction to disease. Today, in late February 2021, the threat of an attack remains significant, though the risk level, the threat level, has been reduced recently to substantial. There remains a serious risk of a terrorist attack in this country, in this island, and there is an increased risk from female terrorists and from homegrown self-motivating actors. You heard Dr. Saltman saying this morning that there is no terrorist event in which women have not played a significant part. By the end of 2019, there were 231 UK prisoners categorised as terrorists, some of whom are right-wing extremists, each of whom on release may present a significant threat. In that year, 280 people terrorism are related. And in total, since 9-11, in this country, 4,682 individuals have been arrested for such offences. That's part of the context for legislation. And so is the problem of uh, radicalisation. Um, in, on the 22nd of April of 2020, UK counter-terrorism police warned that COVID-19 is relevant to radicalisation, saying that socialization, social isolation would make some vulnerable people more susceptible to being radicalised and other forms of grooming, for very obvious reasons. For example, because they spend more unsupervised time online and lonely. Furthermore, terrorist propaganda, especially that related to far-right extremism, has increased during COVID, 
Research by Moonshot CV, a respected and specialist counter-violent extremism technology advisor, they have found that online engagement with extremist far-right-wing content has increased by over 20%, possibly more. So that's part of the context of um, the, which legislation operates. Now I turn to the legislation itself. On that day when I was telephoned and asked to be independent reviewer of terrorism legislation, the Home Secretary, there was already a, a, an Ertl at the time, I knew him well, and the Home Secretary said to me, you'll only have about five to eight days work to do. That's what your predecessor has done. It's all about Northern Ireland and it's getting better. Uh, memorably, later in the afternoon, his private office telephoned me and said, we think you'll have a bit more work to do after what's happened in New York, sir. And in fact, in the first year, I actually did 176 days as independent reviewer of terrorism legislation. But at the moment I was appointed, the legislation we were concerned about was actually the Northern Ireland Emergency Provisions Act, which had been enacted following a report by a law lord, a Supreme Court judge called Lord Lloyd Derrick, um, not the one on Tweed, another one in south of England, Lord Lloyd of Berwick in 1996. What were the issues that were being addressed? Because they apply still today. Well, they were exclusion of people from the United Kingdom, exclusion, financing of terrorism, powers of arrest, powers to detain for longer or shorter periods, the power to stop and search, powers of entry, search, port and border controls, ancillary offences such as glorification of terrorism, issues around the internet, sentencing, the length of sentences and the nature of sentences and the release provisions from sentences, and the very difficult question of the rehabilitation and de-radicalisation of people convicted of terrorism. The Terrorism Act 2000, which is the rock upon which all uh, terrorist legislation ultimately ends, the Terrorism Act 2000, was created and that defined what terrorism is, the use or threat of a specified action where the use or threat is designed to influence the government or to intimidate the public or a section of the public and the use or threat is made for the purpose of advancing a political, religious or ideological cause. The action is a specified action if it involves serious violence against a person, serious damage to property, endangers a person's life other than the person committing the action, creates a serious risk to the health or safety of the public or a section of the public, or is designed seriously to interfere with or seriously to disrupt an electronic system. The Terrorism Act 2000 started a run of statutes which has continued and is continuing to this day. There's one particularly relating to the sentencing and imprisonment of terrorists before the House of Lords as we speak. It was followed by the Anti-Terrorism Crime and Security Act 2001 and the range of issues is uh, it, perhaps important just to summarise because it shows how much we are concerned with it. Weapons of mass destruction, disclosure of terrorist financing activities, the security of pathogens and toxins, powers of arrest in airports and seaports, the retention of communications traffic data, the creation of an offence of using noxious substances to harm or intimidate. Remember what happened in Salisbury and asset freezing. And then there came the Prevention of Terrorism Act 2005, which introduced control orders upon those believed to be involved in terrorist related activity. Control orders were preventative orders which imposed one or more obligations, in fact, up to 
23 obligations on an individual, those obligations being designed to prevent, restrict or disrupt his or her involvement in terrorist related activity. And then there came the Terrorism Act 2006, the Immigration, Asylum and Nationality Act 2006, um, and uh, sundry um, other uh, enactments. Um, I would commend to you the writing of Professor Clive Walker, who's written a standard textbook on terrorism law, and he has written articles which set out the um, various and, and summarise the various pieces of legislation. There isn't time to do all of them now. Um, but, for example, the Counterterrorism and Security Act 2015 um, deals with many facets of counterterrorism legislation, but particularly to interdict foreign terrorist fighters by preventing them from travelling and by dealing with returnees and also um, the enforcement of the prevent element of counter-terrorism policy. So, um, it all adds up to uh, the production of what is called the contest strategy, which was originally um, launched by the government of the time in 2003. Contest was created with four objectives which still exist. They're called the four P's. Pursue stopping terrorist attacks. Prevent stopping people becoming terrorists or supporting terrorism. Protect strengthening the country against attack. And prepare mitigating the impacts of attack. Pursue, prevent, protect and prepare. Um, the um, legislation and the contest um, strategy have caused difficulties of two kinds. One is because they're not entirely coherent, uh, and the other because, frankly, for someone who is a practitioner of this kind of law, like police officers in airports, and I'll say a little more about that in a moment, um, they cannot possibly be able at any one time to gain access to numerous, there are now I think 13 Acts of Parliament, with different bits of terrorism law in them, and remember them all. And one call I would make is that it really is time for terrorism law, counter-terrorism law, to be codified in one single instrument. And it can be done. Recently, the whole of sentencing law in England and Wales has been codified into the sentencing code um, created under the uh, leadership of the Law Commission um, in recent years. So it is possible to codify the law, even if we don't follow the continental course of making the law purposive rather than wholly exclusive. Um, just to give you some examples of the difficulty of applying these statutes, and I'll give you examples from my own experience. Um, a man arrives at London Heathrow Airport. Uh, the police who are responsible for such things stop him because they're suspicious about his passport. The reason they're suspicious about his passport is because it's so clean. He's a middle-aged businessman, and it's got practically nothing in it. They take him under the legislative provisions for questioning. Uh, on this occasion, with his agreement, I was allowed to be an observer whilst he was being questioned. Um, he was asked what he was doing. He said he was going to get uh, a job as a hotel manager. Where are you going for your job as a hotel manager? Victoria. Well, you know, where in Victoria? What's the name of the agency? At this point, he was floundering. He said it's called Victoria. Well, where is it? It's in Victoria. Well, a little bit of further inquiry 
together with some technical work done very quickly on his passport, led them to decide that, in fact, he probably wasn't a terrorist at all. He was probably a spy, but that he should not be allowed into the country. And so within a couple of hours, he was being put on an aircraft back to Moscow. Now, that all sounds very simple, but there were a numerous there were numerous steps that had to be followed in order to be able to deprive that person of what otherwise would appear to be his liberty to enter the United Kingdom to seek to obtain employment as a hotel um, manager, perfectly lawful thing to do, and send him back to Russia in a way that would probably mean that he would never be admitted to the United Kingdom again. So simple things are governed by very, very complex laws. Then um, there's the whole question of control orders, which I mentioned earlier, those restrictive orders introduced in 2005, and TPIMS, Terrorism Prevention and Investigative Measures, which succeeded them. And this is an example of how legislation can be uh, proxy for political beliefs. Um, when control orders were introduced, they replaced a power to detain people without charge in prisons. So where there was a sus reasonable suspicion that someone was a terrorist, he or she could be detained in a prison without being charged, let alone convicted. That was ruled to be unlawful by the House of Lords Supreme Court. So the government had to introduce something else. So they came up with my support as an independent reviewer with the idea of control orders, which imposed controls, including only being able to use one computer and one mobile phone, um, only being able to deal with uh, a, a restricted group of people, a restricted group of visitors to relocation. And I visited a number of people who've been relocated to properties provided by the government in areas well away from where they normally lived. So they could not be seen or visited by their uh, associates in crime. It worked reasonably well. But when the 2010 election occurred, the Liberal Democrats, the party of which I at the time was a member, I'm now a crossbench peer in the House of Lords, but the Liberal Democrats decided that it confronted inappropriately and disproportionately the civil liberties of the people concerned. So they abolished control orders and replaced them with terrorism prevention and investigative measures, TPIMS, which were control orders light, very light. Today, there is a bill before the House, Houses of Parliament, which in effect gives effect to the government's completely correct decision that the removal of the con full control orders restrictions uh, as a political act by Nick Clegg when he was Deputy Prime Minister was inappropriate and contrary to public security and the public interest, contrary to national security, I should say, and the public interest. So those controls are being restored, albeit under a different name, and they will be renewable for more than two years, which was the original limit. I proposed a limit of three years, but the current bill will um, mean that it's possible for them to last longer. That is an example of legislation being subject to political principle, no doubt principle, but not always correct views, which may well damage the public interest. And let me give you an example of how it may have damaged the public interest. Not saying that this is a fact, but I believe it to be a possibility. In White, whilst he was in Whitemore prison, there is now evidence that he went through a desistance and disengagement, a de-radicalization scheme, which was run by people of extraordinary ability and goodwill. And they concluded that he was a model student 
and that he was no longer a da in danger of being a terrorist, indeed, that he was de-radicalised. The people who determined all that did so on principle and on the basis of such evidence they had. Unfortunately, they could not have been more wrong. If, as I have, you talk to somebody who was in a position to know within the prison when Usman Khan was a prisoner on the on the wing, as it were, on the wings, you would have heard that there was not a person who contacted him every day in the prison as a member of the prison staff who believed for one moment that he was de-radicalised, that he was part of a group that was running alternative Friday prayers during Friday prayers, where the imam, again an honest person, was left to deal with the normal congregation, and the radicals stood at the back and had their own uh, Friday prayers at the back of the room. And indeed, such was the extent of it that um, Sharia courts were being run in cells at the prison to the knowledge of the prison staff, but they were just not able to stop it. And these Sharia courts meted out punishments, including floggings, which were taking place within the prison. So there we had a complete disconnect with everyday circumstances in Whitemore Prison at the time. And the judgment that those honourable, honest people, uh, some of them coming from an even older university than St Andrews, and I believe there's only one university older than St Andrews in the United Kingdom, um, um, the name of which could end in bridge. And um, they decided that he was safe to be released. So he was released. And indeed, he was invited to participate very actively in an event that was taking, taking place at the Fishmongers Hall, just by London Bridge. And he arrived in a fake suicide vest and he killed two people and he was eventually killed during what was a horrifying terrorism event on London Bridge and near to it. Now, that was a failure of the PREVENT programme, of the desistance and disengagement system, and he could, on his release, have been made the subject of a control order or a restricted TPIM. Today, or at least after the current bill is passed, those remedies would be available and would almost certainly be used because government, and I make this as a non-political point, government with a small g has learned a lot from the Fishmongers Hall London Bridge accident, incident. But it's not the only such interest incident. There have been at least two similar incidents near tube stations in London in recent times. So what I'm saying is that the, the legislation should be simplified by being codified and that the uh, scrutiny of desistance and disengagement and prevent programmes should be um, improved. Um, I was appointed the independent reviewer of the prevent strategy, did five months work and then had to stop because a judicial review was against my appointment on the basis mainly of the way in which I was appointed by a minister ringing me up, not by an open competition. It took another uh, eight, 21 months for a new reviewer to be appointed. Mr. William Shawcross, and there is now difficulty about his appointment. Um, but it is absolutely essential that people should not be allowed deliberately or undeliberately to obstruct an objective review of the PREVENT programme, because it is absolutely essential that legislation should affect the reality of the effectiveness or otherwise of the PREVENT programme. I believe that the PREVENT programme is capable of being very effective and that in many cases it is already effective. But I, I equally believe that it's somewhat disorganised and needs reform. And I've no doubt that Mr Shawcross will, will work very hard to ensure that an objective report is produced. 
There is also an issue about the scrutiny of legislation. Um, the Independent Review of Terrorism Legislation, it's a very unusual post. It only exists in one other country, Australia. Um, and um, the independent reviewer, um, he, it's always been men for some reason, um, he has, currently it's um, Jonathan Hall QC, he has no power whatsoever. He doesn't have the power to tell anyone to do anything or stop anyone from doing anything. But he does have the power to speak out. And it's a power that has been used, not necessarily by me, but my successors, very valuably and very capably over a number of years. And close attention is paid to what the independent reviewer says. But if the independent reviewer is only responsible for some things, as is the case, and not for others, then it's a bit of a mess, isn't it? Shouldn't the independent reviewer be responsible for everything that's related to terrorism? Shouldn't the independent reviewer have a power to insist at least on a parliamentary debate if he believes that some part of counterterrorism law is not working well? Well, I'm not saying that the questions dictate their own answers, but I think that those are valid questions. I happen to believe that prevent is such a big part of the policy that probably it would benefit from having its own reviewer and inspectorate. But the rest of counterterrorism law, in my view, should be subject to review by the independent reviewer. And he should have the option to be a full time reviewer if he thinks that the work that is required is sufficiently great to justify that. So um, we have a very big program of legislation to discuss. We have an unsatisfactory process of legislation to discuss, and we have an inadequate reviewing system to discuss. I, but I don't want to be a doomsayer because actually we've done more in this country to deal with terrorism than any other country of which I know. In 2005, I was asked by the then government in UK law, and I did a scoping of all the terrorism laws in the world. I think at the time there were 170 different forms of legislation around the world. Some of them were poor, many of them were good, some of them were extremely good. What worried me was that some of the extremely good black letter legislation was in countries where liberties were taken in the operation of the rule of law and people were not being given the same fair procedures that the black letter law set out. So appearances can deceive. I think on the whole in the United Kingdom, we've done quite well. Um, we, we give fair trials to people charged with terrorism offences. We have a fair appeal system. We have a very fair disclosure system so that trials are conducted on the basis of all the relevant and available material. But we still have a long way to go. And I do think that the one thing that legislation is least capable of doing is de-radicalizing anyone. All it can do is set up the programs and the basis of those programs that should be used. I think that far more money should be spent on prevent because it's worth it, because particularly if it can prevent youngsters um, teenagers from becoming terrorists, then it will have done a job worth its weight, whatever the cost. I'd be very happy now, if I may, uh, to stop and to answer any questions that you may have. I'm operating from an iPad, so I'm not sure that I will actually see them in writing. Um, so that, I may fine. have to I may have to ask you, Tim, to repeat them. That, that's